Hi everyone, Mike here from Bikes by Mike with another cycling related video. Today I'm going to talk about two of the largest bike component companies on the market today, Shimano and SRAM. I'll weigh in on which of the two brands I think is best. Okay, let's get to it. The Shimano versus SRAM battle has been raging for years and will continue for many years to come, at least until the Chinese brands really stir things up. But it's amazing. Actually, it's not amazing, it's totally predictable. That almost no one in the mainstream media or even among YouTube influencers is prepared to pick a winner. But I will. I'm not sponsored by them, I don't get paid by them, I'm free to give you my honest opinion. So that's what I'll do. In today's video, I'll tell you why I think Shimano or SRAM is the better brand when it comes to four metrics. Performance, quality and reliability, innovation, and lastly, corporate reputation. I'll wrap things up with my pick for the best overall brand and my final thoughts. Let me start off by mentioning a few things. I've owned bikes equipped with both brands. Most of my mountain bikes over the years have had SRAM components, while my road bikes have been primarily Shimano. So I do have experience using both of these brands. Two, there are things I like and dislike about both companies and the products they make. So neither is perfect. Three, neither of these two is massively inferior to the other. Both produce some good cycling components, and if you choose one over the other, you really can't be making that big of a mistake. We're talking about marginal differences here. Lastly, I'm picking a winner based on everything they produce, not comparing one specific component to the other. But my opinion and examples I use is heavily swayed by their drivetrain lines, because that's usually where the two battle out the most. When trying to pick the better of the two bicycle brands, I like to use four metrics. Performance, quality and reliability, innovation, and corporate reputation. Let's start with performance. Generally, Shimano is more polished and refined in what they come out with, even in their first generation products. And Dura 7900Di2 is a good example of this. The smoothness and sharpness of the shifting in their drivetrains is second to none. The Hyperglide technology does produce some of the cleanest and most smooth shifting you'll find on any drivetrain. But this isn't always the case with their products, and their Shimano 12-speed power meter is a good example of this. Shane Miller has covered this whole fiasco for the last year or so, and clearly Shimano hasn't done a good job in that area. The product didn't work well when it was launched originally, and even after firmware updates, they still couldn't quite get it right. So at this point in time, I'd highly recommend Shimano go back to the drawing board and start from scratch on their power meters. What they're currently doing isn't working and it's not even meeting their own technical specifications of what they're selling. But most people look to other brands when buying power meters, so I won't put too much weight on that product. SRAM works, but it's just a bit clumsy, especially on first generation releases. It's very rare for me to try any SRAM component, especially their drivetrains and brakes, and to be able to say that this worked perfectly right from the start. There's usually something that just isn't quite right. And I do feel like very slight edge to Shimano's rear shifting. You pointed out this is the Hyperglide uh, technology on the, on the cassette, the ramps and everything else. It felt immediate. It felt uh, as if I didn't need to come off the pedals mo momentarily power-wise to allow for the shift. It was just seamless. Uh, not that this RAM is bad. This RAM is very, very good but it was very, just slightly noticeable that I prefer the, the Shimano rear shifting. Like, like, to your point, I would just call Shimano shifting more refined. Yeah. Like it snicks. I call it crisp. Yeah, it's crisp. It's like yeah. snick, 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 yeah. snick, versus like, Shram's a little clunkier, yeah. right? They don't have the ramps that, that Shimano does. Yeah. And so it just felt like a clunkier shift up and down. Slightly slower. Shimano components are known for working well and working well consistently. Again, their first generation DI2 is a perfect example of this. It worked flawlessly right from the start. Battery life was excellent and it had all the features you'd want in an electronic group set. I think I went a full year before experiencing a miss shift. It worked that well. But this isn't just the case with Shimano's top tier lines. Their budget friendly lines also are very polished like the Q's drivetrain released last year. Not super fancy, it's just highly compatible, durable, and it just works. 
perfect for your entry-level consumer. SRAM components work, but the design, overall build, and quality of their products seem to be lacking a bit, particularly in their top tier lines. It always feels to me that they've rushed things just to get the components out the door. Yes, Shimano can be slow to release new products, but when they do, you can be pretty damn sure that it's gonna be good right out of the gate. SRAM comes out as a clear winner when it comes to innovation. I'll give you just a few examples. SRAM released the first fully wireless group set, SRAM Red ETAP 11 speed in 2015. And to this day, Shimano has yet to go fully wireless with its electronic group set DI2. Although Shimano was the first to introduce electronic shifting when Dura-Ace DI2 7900 came out in 2009. And Shimano released their XTR DI2 for mountain bikes in 2015. It offered all the benefits of its DI2 road group set. Small, consistent step up in gears, smooth, fast shifts, and always an optimal chain line. I still think that dated electronic group set is better than today's SRAM Access. The only reason it never became popular is that it was too expensive for most consumers. SRAM released the first one by mountain bike drivetrain in 2012, the Eagle XX1. And this really marked the death of the front derailleur, at least for mountain bikes. And by providing a 500% gear ratio, SRAM proved that it could compete against all two by mountain bike drivetrains. In 2019, SRAM released Eagle Access, the first fully wireless mountain bike group set. This proved to be really popular among riders. Anything electronic is popular these days, but both riders and those in the bike industry loved the ease of installation. Not having to route cables over and through frames just makes things so hassle-free. Around the same time, SRAM came out with the RockShock Reverb Access Dropper Post. This dropper post is always rated as the best or one of the best on the market. And for me, it's the only dropper post I'd install on my mountain bike. Going fully wireless on the dropper post makes a lot of sense, especially when you compare it to an overall access system. Mechanical dropper posts with cables hidden within the frame is a clumsy solution and adds yet another place for frames to just make rattling noises. But the best innovation in my mind is the cage lock, which they first introduced in 2012. A ridiculously simple innovation that you just don't see on other rear derailleurs. Not only does it make it easier to service your chain, but it makes it easier to remove the rear wheel and eliminates any chance of damaging your rear mech in the process. It's a feature that should be available on every drivetrain. Corporate reputation. So I saved the best or the worst for last. Let's start with something fairly non-controversial. How Shimano and SRAM as companies are viewed by most people. Shimano is thought of generally as being slow to market, but producing refined and functional components. SRAM's strengths are that they are innovative, quick to market, and consumer focused. But I view things a little bit differently. SRAM is 100% a marketing-led bike company. Lots of time, money, and energy is spent in this area of their business. Coming up with cool and sexy names for stuff that really isn't all that cool and sexy. And I don't believe it's in the consumer's best interest to have a company spending so much of its time and effort finding ways to convince us, the consumer, that what they sell is the best. But I'll hand it to them, nobody, absolutely nobody, markets their products and their technology better than SRAM, and certainly not Shimano. I simply think Shimano has a better corporate reputation than SRAM. Like many Japanese companies, they are hell-bent on producing the best products possible. But they aren't perfect. How they handled the recall on defective Holotech cranks was nothing to brag about. It appears they were aware of the defects well before they admitted it to the public, and they were hesitant until pushed to offer a hassle-free recall on all defective cranks. There's no way to sugarcoat it. It was a PR nightmare for Shimano. I don't think SRAM's corporate culture is aligned with making the best products for consumers. Rather, I think they're all about convincing consumers that they have the best products. Worse yet, given the size and influence of SRAM, they're able to sway the industry and develop trends that I think are frequently not beneficial to consumers. This is the classic, decades-old beta versus VHS battle. 
Everyone knew that Beta had the better technology, but due mainly to marketing genius, somehow VHS became the one and only videotape medium on the market. So let me give you three trends SRAM started that I believe are not good for consumers. First, one by drivetrains. Don't get me wrong, one by has its place. For mountain bike, it makes a lot of sense if for no other reason than due to its simplicity of omitting the front derailleur. But for gravel, it has its pros, but also its cons. And when it comes to road bike applications, one by is far inferior to two by systems for all but the most niche applications. One by has fewer gears, bigger jumps between gears, and often a narrower gear range. Or they have to use highly inefficient, very small 9 or 10 teeth cogs to get the proper gear range. Remember how for years we were told how bad it is to cross chain? Then SRAM came along to make one by drivetrains commonplace, and then suddenly the problem disappeared. But it didn't. You know, one of my pet peeves, which are these small cogs, small chain ring like one by drivetrains, right? Uh, using a 10 tooth cog is throwing away like three ceramic oversized pulley setups worth of watts. Um, you know, and, and people justify it on a million grounds. Oh, it's lighter and it's this and it's, you know, and it's simpler and I can get the wide range. And the difference between a 10 and 11, I mean, it's, it's like two watts per tooth down there. I mean, you know, there's some, some cassettes that have a nine now. And the 9, I think, is like 2.6, 2.7 watts less efficient than the 10, which is 2 watts less efficient than the 11. I mean, you, you know, we're just we're just pissing away watts for no reason. And you go, yeah, but that 9-tooth cog is light. Well, it, it's, what, a half a gram lighter than a 12? I mean, personally, I don't like one-by drivetrains because I feel like it's the worst of all the worlds, right? You're always in a smaller chain ring than you probably need to be in. You're always using a smaller cog than you probably wood for efficiency and you have these large jumps in between cogs and so but yeah from an efficiency standpoint you know uh, i've got charts and, and and data that we could certainly certainly look at on this but you know you're you're just always in a higher state of friction in a one by setup than you would be in an equivalently geared two by setup so the arrow savings of losing the uh front derailleur and chain ring are almost always offset by the increase in derailleur cage length required to handle the chain. Let's get some facts straight. Two by drive trains are more efficient than one by systems for every gear ratio. And even with a perfect chain line, two by is more efficient than one by. Yes, a lot of variables are in play, but the inefficiency of one by systems over two by can be as little as a couple watts or approaching double digit watt penalties. It's great that SRAM is pushing the evolution of one by for mountain bikes because they have done a lot of good in this area, especially with the introduction of electronic shifting. But one by simply is not the best option for a lot of gravel bikes and most road applications. It's all marketing to suggest otherwise. SRAM knows their strengths and weaknesses and building an efficient front derailleur is not what they're good at. One by for many applications is a solution in search of a problem. Speaking of which, Hookless rims. Envy was the first to launch a hookless road wheel in 2016 with the SES 4.5 AR. And many other cycling brands followed suit, including Hunt Wheels and Zip, which of course is owned by SRAM. Performance benefits of hookless were claimed with little scientific research to back up those claims. The benefits are still unclear, while the drawbacks of such a wheel rim design has been brought to light, many claiming that tires are more prone to blow off hookless rims. Check out my previous episode where I talk about the hookless rim debate. Or check out this podcast by Escape Collective, hosted by Rona McLaughlin, who earlier this year spent an hour questioning Zip on the safety of their wheels. I'll leave it to you to decide whether their responses ease the safety concerns expressed by so many. I'm not convinced, and neither was Rona McLaughlin. I'm certainly not a fan of hookless rim for road use. Flat top chains are used on SRAM Axis ETAP road group sets, as well as their T-Type Eagle Axis mountain bike drivetrains. This is pure skepticism on my part. There's nothing to say that SRAM has made it worse for consumers by going with flat top chains. 
But I do think SRAM has been less than transparent in explaining how long flat top chains last and how quickly they wear down other drivetrain components as compared to traditional drivetrain systems. And this is yet another reason I generally dislike one by drivetrains. Cassettes are ridiculously expensive. My SRAM XX SL T-Type Eagle Access cassette, which I have on my mountain bike, retails for $874 Canadian. When you add sales tax, that's almost a grand for one component of a drivetrain system that wears out regularly. And I don't doubt that it costs that much to produce a cassette that's the size of a dinner plate. There's a lot of machining that has to be done to the metal and just a lot of metal that goes into the build. And they aren't particularly light given their size. The optics are not good here. By SRAM stating that you must use T-type components with their flat top chains, there's an obvious financial incentive there to get consumers to replace their worn components as frequently as possible. Adam Karen from Zero Friction Cycling has talked about this issue recently on his podcast where he raised concerns with their chain wear recommendations. Originally, SRAM's website stated that flat top chains should be replaced with 0.8% of wear and that replacing chains too early may cause premature wear of chain ring and cassette. 0.5% wear is generally the accepted standard today for chain replacement. The bizarre statement saying that early replacement may cause premature wear has since been removed from SRAM's website. But the 0.8% figure still remains and is concerning, particularly with respect to causing excessive wear to other components. Here's what Adam Karen said about it. In essence, taking chains to you know 0.8% and uh, and beyond, it's just bad news on pretty much all fronts. You're really going to eat into your uh, cassette teeth and your chain ring teeth, which is not low friction running and it's also costly. And you're going to just see ever degrading performance from the chain at a more accelerated rate. So, you know, all of that is basically adding up to, I really, really want to have that uh, chat with SRAM, find out why they have a 0.8% recommendation and what are their answers to the concerns that we have both from a component wear perspective and also a chain uh, friction and wear perspective as well. What I want to know is whether drivetrain components running flat top chains will wear out faster than typical one by and two by systems. And I know I'm not the only one confused about this and wanting to see SRAM be a bit more transparent on this issue. SRAM chains, their new flat top hard chrome chains are so incredibly durable now that SRAM themselves have kind of teased the fact that maybe elongation wear is no longer a necessary measurement, that their chain will basically last as long as a chain ring or cassette will last. And then at that point, you just replace the lot and you start again. To summarize, in my opinion, Shimano edges out SRAM when it comes to performance, quality and reliability, and corporate reputation. But SRAM does beat out Shimano when it comes to innovation. Again, both produce premium products for riders with varying budgets. So you're unlikely to be wildly disappointed if choosing one brand over the other. We really are talking about marginal differences here. That said, since neither company is perfect, I do think the door is wide open for some of the up-and-coming Chinese brands like Wheeltop and L2 to grow their market share. Despite the marketing hype by Western wheel brands, the best wheel rims come out of China. And it seems like it's only a matter of time before Chinese direct-to-consumer brands provide competitive, premium, and affordable drivetrain components. So there you go. I picked what I think is the better brand, and that's Shimano. Tell me what you think, and tell me why your choice is the better brand over the other. I'm guessing about 50% of you agree with me. That's all I got for today, folks. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you're not a subscriber to this channel, please subscribe as allow me to produce more content for all of you. See you next time. Happy rolling.